Psycho Acoustics, the audio delusion. So what is psychoacoustics? <laughs> so what is psychoacoustics? Psychoacoustics is a scientific study of sound perception. It comes originally like most words in English from Greek, and it's a connection of two words. Psyche, which means soul, and acousticos, which means hearing. Totally together says what the soul hears. Right? So what's the problem? What's the catch? Dogs. Well, Dogs as primary sense is, someone knows what's a primary sense, right there, the sense of smell. Dogs understand and see their version of the world with their nose, while cats grasp their version of reality with their ears. Primary sense for human beings? Anybody knows? Yep, correct. Sense of vision, and we can see that everywhere. We can see that in our terminology, when you've been in a job interview and you were asked, where do you see yourself in five years? When you tell about someone that is a visionary person, what's your point of view on that and that? We can see it in a professional life. Every person on this show floor can tell me how many pixels are on the screen next to me. We know how many colors it can emit. We know how many times a second it refreshes. And for me, the ultimate proof is the, what I call the right spot test. Imagine the situation where you sit in your house and your spouse calls from the other side saying, honey, I think there is some rice left in the fridge. Can you please check if it's still good? Well, we all do the same thing. We will go to the kitchen, open the fridge, look deep inside, find the rice, the rice pot, put it on the counter, and then we open the lid and look inside. If it looks fine, you will escalate to the next census. But if it doesn't, you won't. If there is something crawling there inside, you will not try what happens next. Well, when it comes to video and light, we understand reflections. I know when I sit with my computer, I will not sit next to a window because I'll have reflection on my window or my screen. If I have a screen, big screen TV in the living room, I have a window behind it, I will need to close the drapes in order to see something. Well, how many of us on a day-to-day -day basis think about audio reflections? How many of us think about the flutter effect happening in your living room? understand what it is. How many of us thinking about reverberation time in your meeting rooms and conference halls and in classrooms? When it goes to signal to noise ratio, we understand how it goes when you go to video. Well, we know to turn down the lights to see the projector, the signal being the projector, what it projects, the noise being the ambient light. We know that we need this ratio to be good enough to understand what's happening in the video. How many of us think on a day-to-day -day basis about signal to noise ratio when it comes to audio? We have in our living room a receiver that can do eight times 150 watts of power in a living room that has noise floor of 35 dBs. Do we think about that? Do we understand how, which frequency do I want to listen to and how much noise am I going to create in my office to the other people when I install my audio system? If we chose our TVs based on their sound performance, we will still all have CRTs in our living rooms. These boxes can contain serious speakers inside them. How many people in the audience here have prescription glasses for either driving or, or reading? Correct. In about 80% of the modern world, adults will have prescription glasses. Did you know that 30 million Americans can benefit from hearing aids? 30 million Americans can benefit from them. And only 16% of them ever use any. It's not that 16% use them every day. 16% ever tried to use any type of, of hearing aids. How many people here have sunglasses on them? And how many people are like me with earplugs in their pocket? It does the same thing. It protects your sense from overexposure. Doesn't matter which one. So we disrespect the audio in our lives. We don't understand how influential it is. We have eyelids. We don't have ear lids. Our ears are constantly open, collecting information, influences our brain, influences how it goes, and we disrespect it to such an extent that I'm standing here talking to you for the last 45 seconds and there was zero information on the screen next to me and you still got everything I was saying. We need the auditory system to communicate. We don't need our eyes as much. So how it affects us, how sound affects us, it affects our work. Walsh Journal says that once instructed, it can take 33 minutes for the average worker to regain concentration 
to go on a task, to repeat the task. All in all, open plane offices drop productivity by 66%. It affects our health. Well, no matter what you are recovering from, every doctor on this planet will tell you the same thing, that sleep is crucial for recovery. Number one complaint in hospitals around the world is noise complaint. How can a patient recover from anything if he cannot sleep at night? This noise during the hospital not only affects the patients, from the elevators, from the staff talking, from the city noises, from all the machinery beeping, it affects also the medical staff itself. When your nurse counting how many pills you need and how many drops to put and how much you need to get, he can get distracted and count wrong. When your doctor writes down your prescription, does a calculation, too much noise will distract her and she will, might do a mistake that can heavily influence you, your loved ones, your father, your mother, your parents, your kids, neighbors, friends. All in all, since the 70s, noise level in hospitals have doubled. It affects our education in a way that is really, really personal for me. Intelligibility is determined by duration. In order for you to understand what I'm telling you, not only I need to create the sound pressure level on your eardrums for you to, to hear me, I need the small silences between the sentences, between the words and between the syllables in order for you to understand what I'm saying. Well, when a reverberation happens too much, I lose this intelligibility. In a modern classroom, in the fourth row, intelligibility is about 50%. Which means, let's go down the imaginary lane now. You send your kid to school, and he goes to the first day of school, and he goes and he finds a place, and his chair is in the last row there. So he's sitting there, the teacher comes in and starts talking. He can understand only 50% 50% of what she says. And he's trying to be focused and trying to follow. In the next two, three hours, he can make it, it's easy. And then he gets tired, and then he's a little bit less following. And day in, day out, day in, day out, and he's following less and less. And then they ask questions, and he doesn't really understand what they're talking about and it's harder for him to follow, and he's starting to feeling a little bit disconnected, and this building called school, this system called education, get tainted with a very negative color that goes, this place is where I'm misunderstanding, I'm misunderstood, and I'm basically really, really bored. Because someone standing next in front of you and blabbering and don't know what he's talking about, it is getting very, very boring. So his entire life path is gonna be changed just because he sat on the wrong seat on the floor. And how many of you went to your kid's classroom and clapped your hands once to see how it reverberates? You walked inside to see how it see? If you will go into a classroom and all the walls are white and clean, there is nothing on the walls, you will go, hey, teach, I think it's, it doesn't look appealing enough. If the whiteboard was four inch wide and two inch tall, you go, this is not efficient enough. You need a bigger whiteboard. If there are no drapes on the window, there's too much light here. But if it looks good, it's fine. Did it sound good? Did you ever? tested, asked. So it affects our education. And keep in mind that about 10% of kids in school are learning in the second language, not in their native tongue. 16% of them every day has some kind of hearing deficiency, either permanent or temporary from exposure to noise or even hay fever or flu. Just the ears are a little clogged, 16% of kids. And on top of that, 33% of them are what we call introverts. Exactly the kind of kids that when it's noisy and they cannot hear the teach will not say, hey, I couldn't hear you. This is the kids that close up when it's noisy. These are the kids that get less and less into what's happening and getting more and more into themselves. And it affects our lives. World Health Organization estimates that about a quarter of the population of Europe is suffering from sleep degraded because of city noises. And how it affects me as a person. It affects sound, affects our body and our mind. Alarm making me sound will make all of us here to secrete cortisol, stress hormone, fight or flight. When I play here sea waves, it will all, it will calm us down. Why? Everybody knows why this will calm us down? The sea waves, the cycles, about 12 cycles a minute. This is the same ratio of the breathing of a sleeping adult. They send your brain, everything is fine. It affects our mind. A human can follow only 1.6 conversation at any given time. Yes, yes, women too. This is why having a conversation where you can overhear someone else talking, it's almost impossible. And this is why the productivity drops as it drops in the open plan offices. It affects our mind. We will move away from unpleasant sounds if we can. If I put that on stage over here, in two minutes this entire place is empty except me and maybe another guy. 
But all in all, it's not what we thought. Because there is a twist to the story. Like I just told you, the sound affects our body and our mind, even if we are not aware of that. And that's the big, big thing to understand. We suppress sound, okay? Everybody were in street corners, talking on the phone, talking to a friend, understanding only them and canceling all the noise. You are sitting here, you were listening to me, you are suppressing everything around you. People around us suppress me, you know, to do their, what they're doing now. We do that, but a research in the States, right here, was very interesting to have an interesting conclusion to that. They took students, put them headphones in a room, played two different words at the same time to two different ears. Then they asked them to follow just one ear. Doesn't matter which one, just follow one of the ears and write down everything you're hearing. So if they heard on the left ear pasta and on the right ear cat or whatever that may be, and write down every word that you heard. And the success ratio was crazy. 95% of the students were successful to follow every word that they heard on the ear that they chose. It got, second stage was they introduced electric shocks to every few words, randomly. Every time you heard the word cat, you get bzzzt. That's all, running words, eh? and again, you heard the word cats, bzzzt. What happened in the next stage, they switched to mono again. So now the two ears are listening to the exact same thing, no more electric shocks are introduced. The first result was very, very predictable. All the students that heard the word cat now were starting to secrete cortisol, were starting to be showing brain waves of stress and fear. All the symptoms appeared. You heard cat, you got buzzed, now you hear cat, you're getting ready for the shock, even if it's not there. That was predictable. What surprised the researchers, the fact that this regardless to what ear they were listening to. Meaning that when you li listen to the left ear and you heard cat, on the right ear you heard pasta, now you hear pasta again, your body still reacts to that as if you paid attention. This means that your brain not only follows what you want it to follow, he also listens on the other side and puts it down in the memory. And he understands the meaning, because when they played words with similar meetings, they got still the same result, regardless to what ear it was played on. So how it affects we? We communicate now, right? Communication. 85% of our communication time is done with the auditory system. We talk and we listen, supposed to listen. And this is 85% of our time that we communicate, we're using the auditory system. We are hearing everything all the time, but we don't listen, actually. What is listening in a hall? Anybody has any idea? I heard a beautiful explanation. What is listening? Listening is making meaning of sound. This is what listening is. And we don't. We don't listen. It's a cultural thing. I'm coming from the Middle East. We have a saying, we have two ears and one mouth. This, for, this way you should talk twice as much. And it's a modern world. You all know that, that this session will be recorded and be sent to you. You don't really have to listen to everything I'm saying now. You can kind of doze off. You'll catch it up later. So it's so easy to not be in the moment and to catch up. It's a busy world. We are in our own sound bubbles and bubbles all the time with headphones or even now your view checking the emails, checking messages. So we are closing up. So we don't listen. The average human attention span is Eight seconds. Eight seconds is the average attention span of a human. And we live in a loud world. This is how it looks. You can imagine how it sounds, right? You already know how it sounds. All in all, for me, it gets to the experience. I will talk about the design of the whole audio system. Not for you designers and manufacturers, this is one thing. Not, not only for the consultants and the acquisitions, not only for the integrators, but to anyone that you consider are customers of yours. It can be a paying customer and it can be your kids asking for something. You now provide services to them. You provide services to yourself. You are your own customer. You need to think about the whole audio system. Well, the, all the guys behind me know exactly what a gain structure is, right? We know how it works. We build it all nicely. We have microphone level and all the stuff. You fine tune it from the beginning. You make sure it works and it's healthy throughout the whole system that we know. So you start off with a very low signal and you go up to the speaker and you have a well-constructed gain that sounds excellent from the speaker. 
but the speaker is not the end of the audio. Audio ends not in the speaker, but in the listener. This audio, feedback, this audio will hit the walls of the acoustic of the room that you're gonna have, gonna echo in this room. And after it echoes in the room, it will echo within you. This is where it goes. This is the end of the story of the line. It goes all the way to the experience of the user. And I always say that a good sound system is like an air conditioner. Once you notice it, something is wrong. If you go to a place and it's too hot, something is wrong. If you go to a place and it's too cold, something is wrong. If you are now not listening to what I'm saying, but you're dealing with the microphone, with the speakers, with the feedback, whatever the case may be, something is wrong. If you're sitting and listening to a hi-fi sound system and you're dealing with the speakers, you're not listening to the music, you're missing the point. Me as a manufacturer, we do amplifiers, speakers, cables, DSPs, all the thing. I don't want you to listen to my equipment. I want you to listen to the guy talking. I want you to listen to the music. Yes, we cannot replace the acoustician or the audio consultant just by thinking about it. But you should keep that in your mind all the time. And this is the delusion of the acoustics that we are running around with. We do not understand the influence and how deeply is that part of our lives. I will finish with a quote of a great, great influence on me, Julian Treasure. It's something that for me sums the whole thing start to finish, no matter what you do, no matter what you do, is this, design and experience, not an appearance. Thank you.